Good morning, everybody. And uh, again, welcome. Um, my name is Gillian Kitley, and I work with the Office of the Special Advisors on the Prevention of Genocide and on the Responsibility to Protect. And I'm particularly delighted uh, to be here this morning and to have the chance to moderate this discussion uh, because I, I've worked very closely with, with two of uh, our eminent panelists, and it'll give me great pleasure to ask them some difficult questions about the work that we've been doing. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to start uh, by introducing the first of the panelists, uh, Mr. Juan Mendez. Um, what I suggest is I'm going to introduce each panelist, ask them some questions uh, about their work. Um, hopefully this will be a conversation rather than a, a formal presentation. And uh, we'll leave about half an hour at the end of the, of the panel where you can ask questions to them. Um, so uh, Juan Mendez, welcome. Um, Juan was the first special advisor on the prevention of genocide. He was appointed in 2004. Um, for those of you who are not aware, this, this position was established as a result of a, a process of uh, review, self-assessment uh, by the United Nations. Uh, because of the failures of the United Nations and the international community to prevent genocide in the 90s, in particular in Rwanda <coughs> and Srebrenica, and uh, as a result of a particular request by the Security Council that it be better informed about situations where there was a risk of genocide. And so in 2004, the Secretary General established this position of the Special Advisor and appointed uh, Juan as the first Special Advisor. Um, each of our panelists uh, were appointed as a result of, of the work that they had done, their dedication, particularly in the field of human rights protection and uh, international relations. And uh, Juan himself has dedicated his, his life to the defense of human rights. Um, you have their bios. I'm not going to go into great detail about their backgrounds, but I'll uh, just mention a few key points. I think uh, Juan in particular has started his life as, as a human rights lawyer uh, in Argentina, defending political prisoners during the Dirty War. And as a result of his work, he himself was detained and imprisoned for 18 months and tortured, uh, and then subsequently expelled from Argentina and uh, moved to the United States. He, um, he has since then, uh, as I said, to get his career to human rights. He uh, not uh, notably worked for 15 years to develop the organization Human Rights Watch, which became one of the, the most um, widely respected and internationally known organizations, um, human rights organizations in the world. Um, he also served as a member of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights uh, of the Organization of American States and was its president in 2002. And he was for many years president of the International Center for the Traditional Justice. And it was during his period that he was working as, as the president of the ICTR, ICTY, sorry, ICTJ, <laughs> um, that uh, he was appointed special advisor. And at the time, this was a position which was almost voluntary. It was a part-time position. He didn't receive remuneration, or he received $1 a year. Uh, and he took it on uh, at the same time as his other full-time work. Um, so, Juan, I would like to start by asking you if you could tell us a little bit about the context in which you were appointed and what were the expectations at that time of this position. And I'd also like to ask, it's always been a mystery to me how you know, the organization made this commitment to, to never again, but at the same time they appointed someone with minimum resources to actually complete or to undertake this very large task. Thank you, Gillian, and uh, I want to thank uh, the Auschwitz Institute and Cardoso and all other co-sponsors for the opportunity to share some, uh, some thoughts on, on this important task. Uh, and um, I think the context uh, was one in which the United Nations uh, had uh, thought through um, <coughs> its failures to prevent uh, uh, genocides in in the near past um, through, the, uh, through many different exercises, but particularly I would uh, mention the Carlson Report uh, that identified certain weaknesses in the architecture of the international community that if, uh, if they weren't the cause, at least certainly uh, contributed to the inability of the international community to respond to, to, to crises. Um, the, the contours of the office were uh, spelled out in the speech by Kofi Annan uh, in Geneva uh, in April of 2004 on the uh, 10th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide, and also in 
the note to the Security Council of July of that year in which he announced uh, my appointment. And uh, essentially, the idea was to um, uh, experiment. And that's why, uh, uh, not that it is a justification, but uh, that's why we started small. We started with a, 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 a part-time appointment and only two uh, uh, members of staff. And parenthetically, let me say, uh, that uh, that was probably the highlight. I, I was privileged to have two of the most uh, committed, uh, professional, uh, savvy, and intelligent uh, uh, members of the UN staff that one could ever uh, hope to to have working for uh, for this uh, experiment. And I think they, they uh, uh, Eckhart Strauss and, uh, and Andres Salazar, made the difference in which I was uh, able to do, if, if anything, because uh, my experience with the United Nations was uh, nil at that point. Um, the idea was to, to create an early warning uh, system, uh, but from the start it was early warning and early action. So I think it was the responsibility of the special advisor not just to cry wolf, not to just announce uh, that something terrible was about to happen, but to come up with a good analysis of the uh, course of events and uh, especially with good ideas about what it would take to alter uh, the course of events. Um, the resources were very <coughs> limited, but the one shining promise that the office made uh, was that this was essentially a human rights uh, office, uh, but that was created in response to a request from the Security Council. And, and therefore, perhaps the ability to be close to the most important political organ in the uh, organization uh, gave the office some uh, opportunities for uh, uh, doing effective work in prevention uh, of, of genocide and other mass atrocities. I have to say that that promise was kind of dashed uh, during my experience. Uh, I actually briefed the Security Council only twice, the first time uh, about Rwanda, uh, but the second time I went to, I'm sorry, the first time about Darfur, and the second time that I traveled to Darfur, uh, unfortunately I was prevented from briefing uh, the Security Council, not by the Secretary General's office, not by the Secretariat in general, but by the members of the Security Council uh, themselves. And then the second time I briefed, uh, uh, after lots of negotiation, uh, I briefed on the general idea of prevention of genocide and how the office was doing uh, at a session in which most countries were represented at lower levels and not an, at ambassadorial levels. Uh, so it was very, very frustrating that there, uh, the, the, the idea of being close to the Security Council uh, was you know, not taken by the Security Council uh, as an important tool uh, in uh, its responsibility to prevent genocide. Um, and then finally, I, let me say in this opening remarks, and I hope you don't mind, Gillian, if I take another minute, that despite uh, uh, these uh, uh, limitations, uh, I think we did, uh, uh, we, we did learn lessons that hopefully were then uh, communicated <coughs> to my successors, Ed and, and Francis, and now Adama, uh, that I think uh, are worth uh, repeating now. And, and I have to say that I learned them in the course of going to the field and trying to determine what early warning consisted of and what early action should consist of, uh, and particularly on Darfur, but then we applied them to other situations around the world as well. And it seemed to me like the international community needs to act simultaneously and in a very dynamic fashion, constantly changing the measures to be taken in four different areas. One, protection, and by this I mean the kind of physical protection uh, that uh, Romeo Dallaire alluded to, uh, armed protection if necessary, hopefully in a cons on a consensual basis, but if we don't have the consent of the territorial state, the international community has to be ready to protect civilian population no matter what, and to do so, uh, 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 and to and, and to mean it when they say that uh, that this civilian population will be protected. The second one is humanitarian action because most uh, most of the victimization takes many different forms, and the most important uh, one of them is that uh, 
vulnerable people are rendered even more vulnerable by displacement, by, by persecution, etc. And so humanitarian assistance is essential to stabilize the situation, but also to bring the victimized population back into their feet as soon as possible so they can uh, themselves uh, design their own destiny. Uh, and, and the third is peacemaking, because the underlying conflict uh, cannot be ignored and has to be addressed in all of its facets. And so uh, 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 actively seeking to bring the parties to the conflict to the table while we do the protection and while we do the humanitarian assistance is absolutely crucial. And the final area is justice. Because by and large, at the time when we are dealing with this kind of early warning and early action, which is late early warning in my mind, but, but it is the early warning that the Security Council and the UN can, can actually do, uh, at that time, many violations have already happened. And impunity for violations only breeds more trouble, more uh, uh, encouragement for future violations. And so, unless we settle the question of justice by insisting uh, on investigation, prosecution, and punishment of uh, all the atrocities that have already been committed, we should be uh, expecting that more atrocities will happen. So uh, justice, and, and fortunately now we have uh, an international tool, the International Criminal Court, that can assist us in, <coughs> in having a credible threat that justice will be done if the territorial state is not willing to do justice on its own. Uh, I'd like to leave it there and, and hopefully return to some of these points later. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Juan. Um, you highlighted one of the challenges that the office have faced and continues to face, which is the engagement with the Security Council. Um, could you tell us what other challenges, the main challenges that you faced during your period as Special Advisor and what you consider to be the successes? Well, I think an important challenge was um, that the, the office was conceived as a, as a hybrid between an inside advisor to the Secretary General, and I would say not only to the Secretary General, but also to the line units of, uh, the, uh, of the Secretariat, uh, but also as a public spokesperson, as a voice, a moral voice uh, of the importance of, uh, of protecting civilian populations from harm, and uh, making sure, uh, and I have to say on this second part, uh, Kofi Annan told me from the start that I would never be censored, and I have to say that I, I was never censored. I was never told that I shouldn't have said that. I was never, uh, I was never told, wait, uh, don't say things that are delicate, etc. But of course, that also put a lot more responsibility on me, because I needed to know that when I spoke, I wasn't going to be censored, but what I would say would carry uh, some uh, uh, expectation that I was speaking for the international community, for the, 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 the United Nations, even though I was doing it on my, on my capacity as an individual uh, working within the Secretariat. Um, I have to say that I had a lot of understanding from uh, many members of the Secretariat, in, and, and of course a lot of support from the Secretary General himself. Um, but I also uh, uh, felt that I needed to make sure that nobody was surprised, that what I was going to say publicly, uh, I, uh, I already said uh, privately to, to, to Kofi Annan and to others so that there would be no surprises. Um, and I think in, in, in general, uh, 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 that combination of uh, public voice and insider advisory services uh, uh, work well, and, uh, and uh, uh, I, of course, was not the only uh, public voice of the United Nations, but when I did have something to say, and I, uh, and of course, uh, spoke pu publicly only when I had uh, uh, some information after going to the ground, for example, uh, uh, that, that, that I could have something intelligent to say, and again, not just raise a red flag, but have something constructive to offer uh, in, in the way in which the international community uh, could uh, turn the course of events and prevent uh, humanitarian catastrophes. Um, I think it worked well, uh, among other things, because uh, Kofi Annan had demonstrated so much of his personal commitment to the prevention of genocide that everybody in the Secretariat fell into form and, and, and supported the idea that the Secretariat was committed to uh, 
uh, to working uh, uh, on prevention uh, in, in both this public and internal man uh, manner as well. Thank you. Juan, I'd just finally like to ask you um, if you could just comment on what you feel the impact of your work on two particular situations was. One was Darfur and the second was Cote d'Ivoire. Well, I, you know, um, in, in, in this area, um, you know, you have to get into it without uh, expecting to have, you know, uh, total success. Uh, this is a very difficult area. I knew from the start that uh, that the experiment was an experiment <coughs> precisely because no one had uh, the clear answer as w w on what needed to uh, to be done. Uh, that even if we do know exactly what needs to be done, persuading the actors to do it is a, is is a completely uh, separate matter. I would say uh, on, on Darfur that I was. Uh, uh, always fr frustrated that uh, we didn't, um, you know, that we didn't stabilize the situation enough so that it could go on the course <coughs> of uh, avoiding uh, uh, future violations permanently. Uh, for example, the fact that uh, literally hundreds of thousands and perhaps million, uh, millions of people are still displaced and living in, uh, in IDP camps or in uh, refugee status elsewhere. Uh, is still a frustrating, uh, you know, reason not to be happy with, uh, with with what we were able to do. On the other hand, I do think that uh, in 2004, before I actually took my job, uh, the international community had taken uh, steps that at least prevented uh, many more uh, massacres from happening. Uh, some massacres continued to happen, but the level of uh, killing that had happened in 2003 and early 2004, fortunately, and one has to keep fingers crossed, was not repeated. And I do think that the international community deserves some credit for that. I would give it uh, mostly to OCHA and, and humanitarian affairs generally, but especially to the African Union, because it was the African Union that at first with very limited resources put uh, boots on the ground, as Romeo just said, and I think uh, with, uh, you know, at, at, at high risk to it, uh, prevented things from uh, going even worse. I think on the matter of, uh, uh, on other uh, country situations, uh, I think uh, we, we can take pride in having in 2004, uh, uh, late 2004, prevented something terrible from happening in Cote d'Ivoire uh, at a time when there were all kinds of armed gangs and armed uh, militias on the ground, and there was a, uh, a really frightening weekend in which hate speech was spewed all over the national television and, and, and radio. And the decisive um, statements by my office, but also by Kofi Annan and by the Security Council, uh, to the effect that people who instigate uh, mass atrocities can see themselves brought before the International Criminal Court, uh, seemed to have uh, had an effect because the, the, the hate speech did stop uh, after the weekend, and uh, although the situation remained very tense, and of course, as you know, several years later, uh, after the, the elections that Mr. Bagbo tried to steal, there was uh, renewed violence. When I look back at Cote d'Ivoire, I think uh, that uh, a, lot, a lot worse things could have happened, and somehow, the international community uh, managed to, to to prevent them, but this is kind of like the paradox of uh, of prevention of genocide: is that we will always remember the genocides that we were not able to stop, and we will always forget those that could have happened and didn't happen. And it's difficult to prove that they didn't happen because of a special reason. In this case, the intervention of the international community, but we can only hope that the intervention of the international community at least contributes to stopping uh, massacres. Thank you very much, Juan. Um, I'm now going to move on to Francis Deng. Uh, Francis was the, the second special advisor on the prevention of genocide, and he was the first to be appointed. At, um, the position was made into a full-time position in 2007. Um, Francis is known uh, for his scholarship, um, his research, and uh, the work that he's done, particularly in certain fields, he was for 12 years the, the special representative on internally displaced people and developed the, the guiding principles on IDPs. 
and he was also instrumental in developing the concept of sovereignty as responsibility, uh, which also contributed to the development of the responsibility to protect concept. Um, he's also a, a, an author of, of more than, uh, he's edited or authored more than 30 books, and, and uh, I can kind of confirm that uh, he is constantly thinking and writing about issues as a prolific writer and thinker on many different issues. Um, Francis, I'd like to ask you, um, as the first full-time special advisor on prevention and genocide, how do you, what difference do you feel that uh, that being appointed a full-time position made to the work that you were doing? What opportunities did that give you? Well, <clears throat> first of all, thank you for your kind introduction, and I want to add my voice uh, to Juan Mendes to thank the co-sponsors with whom we have been working closely over the years. Um, Delaire has, of course, covered the field comprehensively, so I thought what I might do is uh, just highlight a few uh, a few points in my own experience. And dealing with uh, difficult situations, as you said, internal displacement, and after leaving the government, I established the Africa Project at Brookings, which also looked at conflicts in Africa in the post-Cold War era, as the Cold War was coming to an end. And all these factors, all these experiences interplayed in shaping the way I responded. And I think the premise that, uh, to me, I started with is that in all these situations, we are dealing mostly with internal conflicts. And in societies that are acutely divided, societies where there is an in-group and an out-group, and where in a conflict situation, even the dominant group becomes threatened by the other, uh, uh, in most cases, rebel groups. And it's ironic that uh, this notion of existential threat is felt by the more powerful that reacts with a, a kind of genocidal onslaught on the uh, enemy groups. And in these kinds of situations, one asks oneself, these internal victims of uh, mostly governments, uh, where do they turn for protection and for assistance? And these apply to internal displacement. It clearly applies to situations, threats of genocide. They have to look to the international community. But when they do, because of these acute divisions and cleavages within the country, those responsible resist international involvement and very often in the name of sovereignty. A very narrow application of sovereignty as a barricade. And it was in this context uh, that having developed the post-Cold War approach to conflicts in Africa and produced volumes that ended with a volume called Sovereignty as Responsibility, I then used that concept in dealing with internal displacement and as I often said, the first five minutes with uh, a president or a minister were critical in impressing upon them that I was uh, aware of the fact that this was an internal problem, that it felt under their sovereignty, that I'm respectful of sovereignty, but that I don't see it negatively as a barricade against the outside world. I see it as a positive concept of state responsibility to protect and assist its people. And if it needs help to call on the international community for assistance. Of course, the subtext is, if you're going to fail to protect your people and you are not calling on the international community to assist and your people are suffering and dying in large numbers, the world is not going to watch and do nothing. They'll get involved. So the best way to protect your sovereignty is to discharge the responsibilities of sovereignty and cooperate with the international community. That is the concept, of course, with the three pillars that has evolved, uh, the responsibility to protect, which uh, my colleague Ed, uh, will, will elaborate on. Now, the other feature about genocide, and this is just as I ask myself, how do I deal with this difficult issue that is internal, and that was very much resisted by governments? I then ask myself also, how do I deal with this problem of genocide prevention? Of course, I had the advantage of the the foundation having already been laid by Juan. But I still had to 
to find a way that would make me feel a sense of confidence to deal with this very difficult issue. And uh, the premise I started with is that while we all agree that genocide is a most heinous crime that should be stopped, that we should all be united in preventing and punishing, the reality is that people don't want to touch it. You think of Rwanda, you think of the Holocaust, you of course Cambodia, and these are all in historical uh, context. We recognize it when it is gone, but while it is about to happen, the debate is one of, uh, of uh, questioning, is this genocide, is it not, and, and uh, there's a tendency towards denial. So I thought that to make it more manageable, we should demystify this concept instead of seeing this horrific thing that you don't want to touch, define it in a way that brings it down to earth and makes it possible to discuss. And so we define genocide as an extreme form of identity-related conflicts. Uh, and the conflicts do not come from mere differences. They come from the way we manage our differences, the implications of our differences. As I said before, acutely divided societies where some people are discriminated, marginalized, excluded, dehumanized, and others are given the dignity of belonging. And that becomes a source of, of uh, the kind of conflict that can easily escalate. And so we then worked on developing some criteria for analyzing situations, what we call the framework of analysis, which uh, General Delaire referred to. And using that together with, uh, actually this framework uh, we developed from the works of other scholars and people like Barbara Hupp and others who had developed criteria for, uh, for uh, risking or for estimating risks. And we then used this along with other human rights uh, uh, norms for training uh, and also with regional approach. I have to say that defining the problem as an extreme form of identity-related conflicts, which means that the best approach to prevention and even uh, rebuilding and is constructive management of diversity. And just as governments had welcomed talking about sovereignty as responsibility, they welcome conceiving the, uh, the threat of genocide as calling as an issue of management of diversity and constructive management as, as the right approach. I remember going to a country where the prime minister said to me, you know, when we heard you were coming with your title, we worried. This was Guinea, actually. We worried. Does he think we have genocide in this country? But now that you have explained it this way, we need help from the international community to manage our differences. Differences that relate to ethnicity, relate to uh, uh, regional uh, identities, to disparities in development, to religion. The same, I was told that the ASEAN region is extremely sensitive about sovereignty. But when I went there and explained it this way, they said, you know, the problem with your work is your title. I mean, the way you are presenting it is very acceptable to us. Why don't you change your title? And I said, well, uh, I didn't choose the title. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the regional approach has also been very constructive. In going to the AU, for instance, and addressing the Peace and Security Council, uh, they not only welcomed the approach of constructive management of diversity, but they wanted our framework of analysis to be put into their uh, early warning mechanism. Uh, perhaps I should uh, wait for the next question because I want to address the question of Security Council, but I don't want to speak too long before <laughs> you come to the next question. Um, well, this probably fits into the next question. Oh. I was going to ask, I mean, you've, you've highlighted some of the challenges that you faced, including sensitivities around your name and, you know, the title of the mandate. Um, could you um, say what you think are some of the biggest challenges uh, to the successful implementation of the mandate? And I'm thinking of Security Council, but also in relation to addressing country situations. And perhaps you could talk a little bit also about the work that you did uh, in relation to Sri Lanka, because that was one of the major crises that occurred during your tenure. You know, uh, challenges 
in a sense, also provide opportunities. Uh, I do think uh, the approach that I had adopted, and even with the internal displacement, confronted me with a number of constituencies. Uh, that, first of all, you had to persuade governments uh, to be cooperative and to accept the approach. And that requires a certain degree of, uh, of constructive engagement. By the same token, you have people who believe in these areas, you have to stand up tough, you have to talk loud, shout, name and shame. And they would see the soft approach, disengaging of governments as too soft an approach in dealing with a very difficult issue. And this is usually uh, the, the human rights and NGO constituency that has to be persuaded that this is not soft, this is to be practical in dealing with very difficult situations. And then our colleagues, we also had to deal with our colleagues within the UN system who feel that when you come with a title like genocide prevention and get into where they are involved with governments in a cooperative way, you complicate their life. And therefore people don't, don't really want you to come. It took quite a bit of persuasion particularly at the leadership level in New York, for the UN system, for our colleagues, to see that this was not threatening to their work with governments. And quite the contrary, if well understood, could be a basis for constructive uh, cooperation uh, with governments. And then you had the Security Council. Uh, what Juan Mendez just mentioned earlier, in fact it was more fortunate than I was to begin with in that he was invited to address the Security Council on one or two occasions. In my case, because of the history of what I was told, uh, I decided not to knock at doors that would not be open, but to individually first introduce my approach to members of the Security Council one-on-one. -on -one. And I remember going to uh, uh, to the Congo, uh, coming D DRC, uh, the Character Republic of the Congo, and came back with a report that uh, the Secretary General uh, found compelling. Uh, I think my colleague here was there at that presentation. And that was the first time uh, the Security Council uh, welcomed me to address them in what they called informal, informal meeting. <laughs> Double informal. <laughs> And uh, the response was, was quite good. But then what we decided to do is, uh, after having tried to persuade them on one by one basis, uh, they became more receptive. In fact, to my very nice surprise, the Russian ambassador was saying, you know, instead of talking to uh, us one by one, which takes a lot of your time, why don't you address the council together? And, and the French organized informal meetings, the British organized informal meetings. So we, uh, I think we were making something of a, of a headway. But there was still, unfortunately, uh, Juan Mendes had uh, better luck uh, with uh, Kofi Annan than I think I had with the current leadership in that people were careful what statements we made. And usually, we would be required to consult with our colleagues, the senior leaders, particularly the more sensitive missions, I mean departments, uh, before we make a public statement. On Sri Lanka, for instance, I was briefing the, uh, the colleagues, uh, senior management, we were discussing when somebody said, does it really help matters for us to bring in uh, genocide prevention or will it just complicate matters? And my argument was, if we're talking about a conflict that has an ethnic dimension, it has a religious dimension, it has you know, these elements that usually constitute elements in the definition of genocide. I am not alleging that genocide is taking place, but these elements make us obviously look into what is happening with a view to prevention. Well, that was to some extent uh, eventually accepted, but it took some time before we could persuade the executive office for us to release uh, a statement and to have also um, an op-ed piece on, on 
Sri Lanka. Uh, I dealt with Sri Lanka in IDP work, and initially they were also very, very sensitive, afraid of the mandate. But in the end, after I visited, they became among those who were very, very cooperative. On Cote d'Ivoire, there was a resistance about mentioning or looking into what was happening, whether it had any relevancy to genocide. On DRC, I was told by colleagues, when you go, please don't mention anything about genocide, don't mention anything about ethnicity, these are very sensitive issues. But when I went there, all the groups in conflict identified themselves in ethnic terms, and all of them alleged that genocide was being committed against them, contrary to what people were afraid of. So I do believe we have made a lot of progress in better understanding the problem in a positive way, in improving cooperation, especially also with uh, civil society. And I have been asked a number of times, actually, could Rwanda happen today? And my response is, you cannot, of course, rule out, because when this is discussed, some people think it could happen. I personally think that what has been done so far, the number of uh, entities that are engaged in this area of genocide prevention, prevention of mass atrocities, the responsibility to protect, the ones that uh, Delaire was mentioning before, I believe if there were <coughs> a Rwanda emerging, there would be so many voices shouting out, calling for action that I believe it would not happen. On the other hand, I ask myself, well, what about Syria? Is Syria a Rwanda? I, I, I expect not. But we have to be, uh, I think there is a lot done already. These focal points, for instance, in many countries, uh, institutions being set up, the global center, other centers. I believe we have made progress, whether the glass is half empty or half full, I don't know. Thank you very much, Francis. Uh, I'm going to move on now to, to Ed, Ed Luck. Um, Ed was the first and so far the only special advisor who was appointed to focus on the responsibility to protect. Um, he was appointed in 2008, which is three years after the 2005 World uh, Summit Outcome document that articulated RTP, the RTP concept. Um, Ed has for more than, well, around 20 years, I would say, um, worked in various capacities, advisory roles to the, the United Nations as, and is known as an expert on the Security Council in particular. And he's been instrumental in developing and uh, furthering the concept of RTP through his engagement with member states and also through the preparation of annual reports of the Secretary General on the responsibility to protect some various dimensions of RTP. Um, Ed, I'd like to start by just asking you, um, you know, as the, the first special advisor on RTP, um, what were the initial challenges that you faced in um, preparing the framework for the work that you were doing and in your engagement with member states? Uh, thank you very much, Jill. And um, let me begin with an apology. I happen to have pneumonia, so my voice goes every now and uh, then. Um, which is probably the good news, so I won't go at, at great length. And, and um, thank you to the sponsors for uh, putting this together. It, it's something I was looking forward to. And uh, thanks to my wife for putting me together to uh, be able to make the trip to the east uh, and be semi-coherent. Uh, but um, no, it was, a, it was a fascinating time. And I think Juan knows about being first at trying to do anything is, is uh, challenging and sometimes a little bit daunting. What I liked about uh, the challenge was the complexity of the different pieces, uh, because I had been asked to develop R2P conceptually. So as a sometime academic, the sort of intellectual construct, the more systematic, structural way of thinking about the issue uh, was intriguing. Uh, but one had to put that together with the second piece of the mandate, was, which was really to get as many of the 193 member states as possible on board. Um, many of them had signed up for the outcome document in R2P uh, in typical UN fashion in a rhetorical commitment. Uh, there was a lot of uh, after the fact uh, sobriety uh, about, oh, was this actually what we bought onto? Uh, some of the states that people think of as proponents actually had somewhat mixed feelings. 
uh, about it. And uh, there are some states that knew from the beginning they didn't like it, and over time that wasn't getting any better. So it was uh, fascinating as a sometime um, student of politics for me to think about how you begin to build coalitions, how do you bring people aboard, um, and you can't develop a concept that can't be sold politically. I mean, for an academic it's fun to do, but that wasn't the job. The job was to bring those together. And then the third piece, which probably was in some ways the, the uh, um, more frustrating at times, was to put it into an institutional context. Um, what would be the expression of R2P within the array of, of UN uh, units of one sort or another? How would it fit? And of course, one of the most important pieces was how would it fit with uh, genocide prevention? And you know, the very good news was that I had great respect and known Francis for a long time. And I think having that personal relationship beforehand allowed what otherwise could not conceivably had worked, putting two special advisors uh, in one little office is not always the most promising thing to do, but I think in this case the synergies were, were quite quite positive. But the second part of the, the third piece of the mandate uh, was to develop operationally, obviously, to apply R2P. And I think one of the challenges that came up very early uh, was that before the strategy was fully developed, before there's any report from the Secretary General, before he even gave his first speech about R2P, we've been sort of waiting to put the pieces together properly, uh, before the political support was really built, uh, Kenya happened. Uh, and we had to decide, was this an R2P situation or not? Um, I, I appreciated Juan's uh, idea that when coffee was behind this, everyone else in the graphics got together. And those must have been different days. Uh, uh, I, I think Francis is a more sober reflection uh, that uh, in some ways I think because the Secretary General was so enthusiastic about this, because it had been one of the things that uh, he talked about so much in his campaign in 2006, because he was beginning to make it a signature issue, uh, meant that other parts of the bureaucracy were rather suspicious. Uh, you know, I had a, somewhat of a relationship with them, had got them into the subject. Uh, so this didn't mean they all of a sudden fell over in, in enthusiasm. Uh, it meant a lot of them said, oh, wait a minute, this could be threatening. So here came Kenya, um, and we, as I say, we had no strategy, but it just seemed to me this looked like a clear case for prevention. And uh, to me, it seemed very important that the first time we tried to act on R2B, he be in a preventive, not a reactive mode. Uh, it looked like something approximating uh, ethnic cleansing was occurring. Uh, we worried about how it might escalate. Uh, to me, it was one of the UN capitals. How could you, with Nairobi, how could you not pay attention to what was happening in Kenya? Uh, and uh, I thought, you know, we should take at least rhetorical uh, action on it and uh, should be reminding the parties uh, that they have responsibilities, very much in the way that Juan had done uh, with Cote d'Ivoire uh, a few years earlier. Uh, but I must say, one of the big departments in the UN was handling this. Uh, and handling it in a more diplomatic way. Uh, and I tried a number of times to get an R2P angle into the policy with no particular success. Uh, and then finally the policy committee, sort of the, the, the uh, um, cabinet for the Secretary General was going to be meeting on Kenya. Um, and, uh, you know, I talked to him about it and he said, yeah, I agree, you know, come and make your case. And, but I must say, looking around the room, there wasn't a single UN entity there and there all pretty much senior to me, uh, that thought R2P should be brought into this. This was just troublesome, it was controversial, it was difficult, it was unsettled. Why suggest that it was going in this direction? I didn't have to wor worry about the G word at least, but I had a lot of other baggage with the other atrocity crimes. And uh, you know, looking around the room, there was basically no support except for the Secretary General. And that was enough. He said, you know, I agree 10,000 percent. And that, you know, laid the basis for adding that approach there. Uh, so that was certainly a significant challenge. I think the second one that came on very early was a very different sort. Uh, Cyclone Nargis uh, for uh, Burma, Myanmar. Um, you know, the French foreign minister, uh, known for uh, being one of the fathers of the idea of humanitarian intervention, uh, uh, Kushner, had said this looked like an R2P situation. We had just come out with the SG's report. I had been telling all the member states our approach would be narrow but deep. Only those four crimes in their incitement, and not an inch beyond, but very deep in the number of ways we would go about it, but we would not vary from those crimes that had been agreed. Uh, and, um, you know, reporters started calling, what do you think about Foreign Minister Kushner's statement? Uh, 
and my reaction was better not to consult with anybody. Uh, you know, Juan had the experience I did of having a full-time job outside and, 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 and doing this as a second full-time job. So, you know, I was sitting in, in, in IPA, I, IPI at that point, and um, the phone calls kept coming in, and I said, well, you know, better not to consult with anybody. Uh, just go out and make a statement saying this is not what the member states had in mind in 2005. This is not R2P. Uh, and uh, this way, if the Secretary General disagreed, he could say, oh, this is crazy academic, you know, and uh, sort of disown it, um, and uh, let the let the heat come as it may. Needless to say, um, I got worried with the, the intensity of the reaction uh, that we would have to start having visas to go to, uh, to Paris, um, but apparently I had insulted France, uh, which is not a wise thing to do. Uh, but I think it was very important because obviously politically, uh, the large majority of states were looking to see the first time one of the five permanent members puts on the pressure, would you bend? And I thought it was very important to say no. And it was also important not to, uh, you know, invoke the SG's name just in case he didn't feel that way. I think in the end it worked out that uh, we can still travel to Paris. Uh, and um, uh, I think the Secretary General was pleased with what was said and very pleased he didn't have to associate himself with it. But I think those are two early things that came up before you had sort of any strategy, uh, any particular uh, um, uh, sense of momentum among the member states. We, we, sometimes things don't come up at convenient opportunities. Thank you, Ed. Um, the, the last 18 months that you were in the position of special advisor, um, so the, the <coughs> intervention in Libya, and also the uprising in Syria that's become a, since then a, a very violent civil war. Um, how do you feel that the Security Council's response to both of these crises has affected support for R2P? And uh, how, what do you think the office um, should be doing in the next year or two to try and um, reflect on the, these developments and to, to work further to build consensus on R2P? Well, first, I hope we don't have to wait another year or two before we get another special advisor to, to do this work. Uh, you know, I hope. So do we. <laughs> get around to this and moving it. Although I know obviously SG is giving a lot of thought to this. Um, I, I think the paradox um, is that the fact that the Security Council is very active on an issue does not mean that the office necessarily is or should be just as active. I mean, I think in many cases the office makes its largest contributions in cases where the council is not particularly seized of an issue. Um, and, uh, you know, I think Juan's uh, example of, of Cote d'Ivoire at an early stage in 2004, uh, Francis's uh, work with uh, Guinea Conakry, um, uh, I think our work on, on Kyrgyzstan, uh, I think there are places where we made significant contributions in part because they were not uh, seized so much by the Council as major political issues. And I don't think that, uh, you know, sort of consensus in the Council uh, guarantees effective action on the ground. You look at DRC, uh, one of the major failures, I think, for R2P in the UN and the international community in general, it's not because of fundamental blockages in, in the Security Council. There are differences, but, you know, we can't blame everything on, on that particular situation. Uh, Libya, I think we did react very quickly uh, in, in the office, uh, as soon as the word, and, and, and uh, uh, <coughs> Romeo uh, uh, referred to that, as soon as the word cockroach came up, boom, you know, how could you not think immediately of Rwanda? Uh, so we responded, I think, very quickly with the statement. Um, and I, I disagree a little bit with Francis. I, I never felt that we were required to clear uh, statements. And the SCE often said, you know, say what you have to say. Uh, but I think we thought it was wiser, uh, partly because we were issuing a lot of statements on a lot of issues. And I thought it was very important that we be seen and heard on lots of issues a lot of the time. And if we were seen as constantly going against the grain of others in the Secretariat, I think it would have been awkward. Sometimes we did release statements others didn't like. Uh, sometimes uh, we delayed a little bit. Sometimes we modified language. Uh, sometimes the Secretary General, we'd put it into a statement he was making as a compromise, uh, which often was the best solution. Uh, but so I think there was a quick response on Libya rhetorically. But when the Council really got going and started drafting this, that, and the other thing, I don't frankly think we had much of a role. Um, now on Syria, I think it illustrates a lot of things. A lot of people, it's the death of R2P, et cetera, et cetera, which is nonsense. Uh, no uh, principle is observed all the time. I mean, if that was the case of human rights, you know, it wouldn't have survived 1948. 
um, you know, we have to recognize that you're going to win some and you're going to lose some. I think the, a case like that is are we making a difference in a positive way? It's a little early to tell, but I would contrast the international response on Syria now uh, with that of 30 years ago when, when Bashir's father, uh, you know, crushed 20,000 plus people uh, in, in Hama rules with no international reaction, not a whimper. 20,000 people, so what? Just, you know, that's his business, internal affairs. You could hardly say that he's getting away scot free politically on this. I think the international response about atrocity <coughs> crimes in many ways has been enormous. Uh, one of the things that concerned me from the very beginning, uh, and I am spending much more time in Syria than anyone would have wanted to, uh, was not only what is happening currently and the kinds of atrocities that are happening now, but the end game. Uh, you know, it just seemed to me that the conditions for a genocide uh, are being created in Syria. A small minority, uh, the Alawites and various allies uh, of them, um, seen as having special positions in society, seen as being part of repression, uh, a large three-quarters of the population uh, feeling repressed uh, if and when, and I think it will happen, the tide turns, government collapses. Uh, the possibility of reprisal crimes uh, with an ethnic religious element uh, of enormous, enormous scale, lack of real civil society organization, lack of much international involvement on the ground, uh, lack of real cohe cohesion among the uh, opposition. There's just a lot of grounds to think that could be the really, really horrendous piece of this. You know, 70,000 people, it's just horrendous, but it could be that much more. Uh, and that's a message, you know, we started taking the Security Council members individually uh, starting in the summer of, of 2011. Uh, it happened that, actually I think I was the first person in the UN system to say that the acts that were occurring, uh, you know, appeared to be uh, crimes against humanity. Uh, it was actually before the High Commissioner, I mean, she tends to be quicker than we are. Um, but uh, we actually were first on that. Um, and I think the engagement with the Council uh, at least in those days, was very active. And I think Francis put it very well. Uh, a lot of individual meetings. And I didn't find the Russians or the Chinese or others shutting the door. Uh, we sometimes had fairly heated conversations. But I think they recognized just as much as anyone else that the historical tide of engagement and concern about these issues is continuing. And it continues for them as well as for everybody else. They may not like it. They may want to resist it. Uh, and I'm not happy that the word R2P, or the phrase R2P, isn't being used by the council uh, this year. We were amazed at how much it was used, you know, uh, for this burst of activity uh, with with uh, 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 Libya and other crises. But I do know, and I, I remain a student of the council, the discussions among council members about these issues, I think, are as active as ever. They just don't want to publicly put these into resolutions, and I think that's understandable. And I think one of the paradoxes we faced was that the message we're bringing about, uh, you know, the end game in Syria was something the Western countries didn't want to hear or didn't want to, because they thought that was uh, in some ways leading to the Chinese, uh, Russian, Syrian message, uh, which of course was not the intention. And, and the other side didn't much want to hear about this anyway. So I think the politics were very difficult. But uh, I do think R2P will be part of the international engagement in Syria. Uh, once things uh, get settled militarily. And I hope will be part of the principles uh, for the, for the post-conflict situation. And I think it's very interesting. Uh, in, in South Sudan, when the Council's resolution, uh, which was unanimous, Chinese, Russians, everyone on board, uh, used R2P language as part of the mandate for the UN peacekeeping force uh, in Southern Sudan. Uh, was it, it was to uh, advise and assist the government of South Sudan and its, I think, military and police has said, uh, in fulfilling uh, its responsibilities to prevent those four crimes and their incitement. So, you know, I could imagine a similar kind of thing in Syria uh, if you get more of a police or international engagement there over time. But so I think it's there, but it's just a little bit under the surface. Thank you, Ed. Uh, my last question um, relates to the last year's report of the Secretary General, which was focused on timely and decisive response to, to crises. And I'd like to ask you uh, which you feel. We, we talked about the use of all available tools, uh, tools that are available under the chapters 6, 7, and 8 of the UN Charter. 
Which do you feel are the most valuable of these tools for prevention purposes, and which do you feel the most underused? Well, I've argued from the start that we should be very careful. I mean, one timely and flexible, you know, early and flexible response uh, based on the circumstances <coughs> of each case was important. Uh, and we not have any sequencing. That's why these three sort of baskets from the ISIS report, I don't like the rebuilding term. It has an implication of, of sequencing. I like much better the assistance pillar, which is an ongoing effort to assist states. And particularly under the last sentence of paragraph 139, uh, states under stress. I think that's a great opening and, and should be um, uh, considered more. So it shouldn't be rebuilding after the fact. It should be assisting states to prevent these kinds of things on an ongoing basis. So I think most of the tools um, that would come under that assistance basket are underutilized and under, under understood, you can say that. Um, including by the academic community. We just don't have the studies, we don't have the knowledge of what kind of development policies, for example, would help prevent these kinds of things from occurring, and what kind of development uh, policies do just the opposite, and that tend to favor particular groups in society, set them up to be targets, uh, in fact, are, are harmful. The development per se is not helpful uh, to preventing atrocities. Certain kinds of developments and certain kinds of, of governance issues, I think, could be. Um, but we need much more understanding of that, and same for post-conflict peace building and, and uh, other things. I think we need to understand that pillar much more. Uh, I think the uh, Chapter 6 powers uh, of the Security Council, uh, paragraph, uh, uh, one, uh, paragraph 34 on, on Article 34, I'm sorry, Article 34 on investigations. The Council can investigate any situation that might lead to a dispute, that might lead to a threat to peace and security, and I think those relating to potential atrocity crimes clearly qualify under 34. The council never really uses that in the way that I think it ought to. Um, so I think those are the ones that I, I think are, are, are underutilized. Um, and I don't think that the use of force should be a last resort. And, uh, you know, it was a lot, of, a lot of battles on that one, but I said I just felt that we shouldn't say we're going to have an a, a, a early and flexible response, but the use of force is always the very last thing. You know, we've gone through 46 other things. And, whatever, and then we might think about it, uh, you know, the bodies are just going to pile up, and uh, that's not what we need. I mean, you can imagine in Rwanda, with Rwanda on the Security Council in 1994, how many other things you would have gone through for how much time before you would think about that. So the wording that we use, it's not lovely, but that, that the use of force is a measure of last resort. It's among those things which you don't look at as the most easy things to do without consequences. You recognize that they, they have to be careful. but you don't wait in a time uh, sequence until everything else is exhausted. So I, I guess the other thing I'd say, just in closing, is that uh, Chapter 8, um, I think, and the way it's applied, uh, needs a lot more work between the council and regional, and between regional and sub-regional organizations. Very important, very much recognized, but I'm not sure that we quite have the, uh, the best tools uh, between the council and its counterparts. Many thanks, Ed. I'd like to open the floor now to questions. Um, when you uh, uh, ask a question, I'd like you to ask if you could identify yourself, but also say who you'd like to ask the question to. Um, so Sam has the mic, and please, anyone who'd like to ask a question. Uh, this is Stephen, and I'd like to ask a question uh, to Dr. Luck. Uh, he just said something that I strongly object to, that we don't know what policies we can affect to prevent uh, uh, this genocide. We know for one thing that genocides come primarily from ignorance and from prejudice. 30 years ago, as a young editor, I was invited to look at the madrasas in Nigeria and Cameroon that were run by Saudi Arabia. These were institutions that were geared towards training children to hate. After my study, I was fortunate to meet the uh, president of Nigeria and the president of Cameroon in my report. Cameroon took immediate measures, Nigeria didn't. The madrasas in Nigeria became Maitasini, Boko Haram, and since then, 40 people have died from the prejudice. So in that instance, we know that if we fought prejudice, all the 40,000 people in Nigeria and the threat of civil war in Nigeria today would not exist. Uh, two years ago, I was invited to look at the madrasas in England 
and the schools in the Palestinian territory in Israel. And I saw exactly the same pattern of institutions that train little children to hate. Some of the schools, especially those in Palestine, are sponsored by, by international organizations like UNESCO, by the United States and European Union. And we know that eventually this uh, teaching of hate would only produce genocide because that's what they do. So we do know part of the problem, the source of genocide. And we refuse to face it for diplomatic reasons, for political reasons, for some other reason. Why is it that we cannot come out, that the international uh, community cannot come out to condemn these institutions that train people to hate each other? Um. Sure, I respond. Uh, thank you. A very good point. I, I think I, I wasn't well understood. I must not have expressed myself well. Uh, what I was speaking about was that we don't know about enough about what kind of development policies that can be helpful in this regard. In other words, if we're advising the international financial institutions or we're advising governments in their development policies, uh, how do you nuance those in a way that um, uh, don't create <coughs> pernicious negative side effects within societies that might help lay these kinds of conditions. So obviously tolerance, uh, pluralism, uh, uh, respect for others, et cetera. I couldn't agree more uh, with what you're saying. And obviously the teaching of these things uh, is extremely important. And I think the, the social piece is, is pretty clear. Uh, I think the cultural piece is, is reasonably clear. But I think in terms of the, uh, the implications for uh, other aspects of, of sort of more hard-nosed policy, uh, of taking a, an atrocity prevention perspective. I, frankly, I haven't seen many studies of these, and I haven't seen a lot of discussion. Uh, we had some discussions with the bank, um, but they would, didn't go very far. It was very early. But uh, uh, your point is well taken. Thank you. Yes, <clears throat> Hello, Catherine Barnes, excuse me, from Eastern Mennonite University. In Juan Mendez, in your opening remarks, you talked about four different types of goals, protection, humanitarian action, peacemaking, and transitional justice. But it seems to me- and justice. Justice, justice, good, thank you. All of these clearly are things that I think we all recognize the central importance of, yet the methodologies and approaches often taken in pursuit of those goals sometimes have quite different logics. And I'm wondering if the members of the panel can try to tease out some of the dilemmas that sometimes can be found in which um, approach might be given precedence at any one point in time in an overall response to atrocity prevention. I'm thinking Darfur, Sri Lanka, Lord's Resistance Army, just to name a few. And what might be the implications for a more holistic and systemic approach to transforming these systems? Thank Thanks you. for the question. Just, just to be clear, I actually feel that all four uh, areas have to be covered simultaneously and in good faith and, and, uh, and, and with strong measures. Uh, I think in each of them, because the situation on the ground is very dynamic, we always have to rethink what priorities within each of the four. But I would never say that uh, well, at least I don't uh, think that we should privilege, say, protection to humanitarian assistance or, or humanitarian assistance to justice. I, uh, be between the four, uh, my argument is that all four of them have to be taken very seriously. But in each of the four, you're absolutely right that we need to have uh, flexible tools that respond to the needs of the moment. And there, you know, uh, my interruption interruption of your question was uh, you know facetious and I and I apologize for that because what I meant is justice and then transitional justice can be some very good uh, flexible tools that can be applied at different moments uh, I don't mean necessarily that always we have to go to the ICC but I do think that justice has to be at the center and 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 within that yeah you can have sequencing you can have uh, say, truth-telling and reparations uh, at one point and insist on domestic prosecutions later on when you actually have the 
capacity to do, uh, to do prosecutions in a serious way and with uh, fair trial guarantees and not before. So uh, I just wanted to clarify that I don't think there should be uh, priorities within the, between the four areas that I uh, assigned, but certainly flexibility and different measures in, in each of the four. Thanks very much. Thank you. Next question. I'm Lisa Shirk from the Alliance for Peace Building and Eastern Mennonite University. And some of you mentioned some of the negative effects, the consequences, also known as the second or third order effects of military intervention, the arming of rebels and what can happen after that. And Ed Luck, you just mentioned the negative impacts sometimes of development. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about the responsibility while protecting and this forecasting of potential scenarios that come from any sort of intervention that can actually go wrong and end up fueling uh, genocide or mass atrocity instead of um, inhibiting it. Uh, very interesting question. Uh, <coughs> I see we have quite an Eastern Mennonite uh, uh, faction uh, in that part of the room. Um, which is a good thing. Uh, on, on RWP, if, if some of you don't know the acronym, uh, it's the phrase responsibility while protecting that the pres president of Brazil uh, put forward uh, at the uh, General Assembly debate, uh, the general debate as first speaker uh, in September uh, 2011, wasn't it? Uh, and uh, it was curious because uh, we had just had the debate, I guess, seven, eight weeks before, um, the annual uh, informal interactive debate uh, on uh, R2P, and the only state of all the member states that said, you know, they're not really ready to talk about the third pillar and the response pillar uh, was Brazil. And then, you know, weeks later, the president of Brazil comes to the whole General Assembly and says, you know, we want to focus on responsibility while protecting, which is really one of the fundamental issues under the third response pillar. So I was delighted to see that, and I think there's been quite a constructive dialogue that Brazil has encouraged uh, from that point. Uh, it stemmed from their concern, and I think some others on the council at the time, South Africa and a few others, uh, that in the military response uh, in Libya, uh, that there were casualties, there were consequences that had not been sufficiently taken into account. I think that gets very much to your question about forecasting. Um, and uh, I participated in some of those discussions and, and uh, certainly had a lot of interactions with our friends from Brazil on this. And I think it produced, uh, I think, a, a better understanding among the member states. Uh, but there are a couple caveats. One, to say that there are some negative consequences of acting has to be weighed against the consequences of not acting. Uh, and, you know, to many people, when uh, uh, Gaddafi's forces were at the gates of Benghazi and he said, blood's going to flow from the streets, you know, we had reason to take them seriously. And, uh, you know, I don't know what we would be saying now about R2P if, in fact, his forces had occupied Benghazi, if there had been tens of thousands of people killed, as many people thought. Uh, what would we then be saying about the responsibility to protect? Uh, we would be saying it's one of these irrelevant uh, uh, rhetorical exercises that are so uh, popular at the UN and doesn't really have any teeth. Uh, but that said, and I think the report this past uh, year uh, of the Secretary General addressed this quite carefully, and I actually spent some late hours working on that responsibility while protecting sort of section. Um, R2P makes very clear that you have an obligation to act. Uh, but in having an obligation to act, you have an obligation, I think, at the same time, and it's implicit, uh, to do so in a way that produces the most positive outcomes and the fewest negative outcomes. <coughs> the recognition has to be that even as careful as NATO was, and it was very, very careful in its targeting, there will be some casualties. Uh, but I don't think anyone who's looked at it carefully would suggest that the level of casualties uh, from the, the use of air power there was anything close to what would have happened uh, had, had it not been that kind of an intervention. Now, I do think the question of the spread of arms uh, is a very serious question. Uh, I don't know whether people know exactly which arms went where and where they originated. Where, where their origin happened to be. But Libya was not exactly bereft of arms before the intervention. Uh, uh, Libya was known as a very heavily armed country. Uh, the um, 
protests that turned into an insurrection in many ways. Uh, was going to, they were going to get arms one way or the other. There are many states supporting them, uh, many states including uh, from their Arab neighbors uh, that uh, were all too happy to send in arms. So I don't think that, frankly, uh, is a consequence of R2P. Uh, I don't think it was a consequence of the intervention. Uh, those things were already happening uh, and were going to happen. And they related to the nature of politics within Libya, the nature of the society, the neighborhood, uh, and a lot of other things. And obviously, a lot of these groups, uh, terrorist groups and others, uh, in, in that part of the world uh, pre-existed uh, uh, what happened in Libya. Um, now, are we going through a, sort of an adjustment phase or is this the start of something that's going to spin out of control? I don't know, and I wish we were better at forecasting. You know, I think you're absolutely right. One has to think about it. But in thinking about it, you have to think about both sides. And, uh, you know, someone could have easily, I'm sure people did in, in 1994 and 1993, wrote you know, if Rwanda and the government, of course, was busy making these things. You know, if there's an intervention, this will happen, that will happen, one thing or the other, so they could go and, and do their killing. <coughs> so I think we have to be very careful about what are the motivations uh, for these claims and, and how accurate are they. Um, I remember when we had a side meeting um, uh, at the Human Rights Council on R2P last summer uh, before I stepped down, and a delegate uh, got up and said that uh, Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people had died because of R2P interventions. I asked him to name one. You know, he didn't have any. But it was a great statement. You know, it sounded really good. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands. What was he talking about? Where? You know, he didn't have any examples. But he knew it must be true. So you know, I think we just have to be very careful with these things. But very good question. Thank you, Francis. Can I just make uh, some qualification here? Um, I, I tend to agree with Ed that uh, all three pillars uh, must stand equal, or else the edifice, as he often puts it, will not stand. At the same time, there is a tendency on the part of those who are opposed to R2P to equate it with intervention. And that is why Ed and I, in our joint office, put a lot of effort into explaining, and even in his reports of the Secretary General, into explaining that R2P is not the third pillar. And that, in effect, the third pillar, whether we call it a last resort or a measure of last resort, uh, is not the one that is given top priority in dealing with R2P. Prevention becomes critical. And, and frankly, Boutros Ghali used to tell me that we in the third world are afraid of intervention by the more powerful states, and this is a misplaced concern. Because he said, the opposite is the case. The opposite, denial, ignoring, not wanting. To put your young people into harm's way, either you have very strong national interest, or you are getting to a weak situation where you don't risk much, or uh, there is a collapse, and therefore there's a vacuum. Otherwise, intervention, is an extremely unpleasant thing that most c countries don't want to get involved in. And that is why I think it is very important for us to develop not only tools for prevention, but also engaging governments constructively to know their responsibility and be able to address those responsibilities. The use of religion, for instance, uh, as a tool, we, you know, we wrote in the office a report on the situation of, uh, of the Christians in, in, in Egypt. There was some sensitivity about should we actually uh, reveal this? Should we even send that report to, to Egypt? Why not? You are advising them that there would be negative consequences in certain use of religious pre uh, prejudices. I told this regime in Sudan when they came into power in 1989 and I was asked to address the conference. I told them about the crisis of identity in the country in which religion was a major factor. And I said, you will have to choose your priorities. Do you want the unity of your country as your top priority? Or do you want adherence to your version of Islam as your priority? Should you choose adherence to Islam the way you understand it, 
and apply Sharia, then you must expect that the country would be divided, cannot be united. Of course, Sudan is now divided, but there are Muslims who would argue that there are different ways of looking at, at Islam and at Sharia, and that the extreme version is not necessarily the best version for maintaining the integrity of the country as a whole. The same can be said of Nigeria, or I go to Burundi, and there was this burly minister of interior who had intimidated everybody about international involvement in his country. And I saw in his face immediately that he was uh, the type who would be confrontational. So instead of my usual little speech, I just opened the conversation and he started talking. We don't want foreigners to come and tell us what to do in our country. We have our African dignity and all that. I listened to him and said, Mr. Minister, as an African, I can only agree with you about African dignity, but African dignity should not respect some groups as against the others. African dignity should be experienced by all Africans. In your country, one group is seen as more favored than the other. My colleagues from the UN were amazed that I would talk to the minister that way, but he did not react negatively. I think it is important to engage governments and with some deference and respect, you can say anything. It's a question of how you say it. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one more question before we wrap up. Um, sorry. Is it? Joseph Klein, of the UN correspondent with Canada Free Press. I guess my question is addressed to uh, Mr. Luck, but uh, anyone can comment on it. Um, I guess, th is there a line between the policy of RTP and its uh, ultimate re resort, if you will, to intervention versus regime change? And isn't that where things got off the rails with Libya? And I, he I, I think I heard you to say, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, a number of Western nations re relating to Syria um, want to uh, kind of subordinate any mention of the responsibility to protect in relation to what might happen in a post-Assad uh, scenario. Uh, and of course, they seem more focused on regime change. So I'm wondering if you see a tension uh, between uh, trying to implement protection of civilians in a more limited scenario versus it morphing into uh, taking sides uh, in a civil war and, reg and ultimate regime change as a policy. Thank you. Um, I think, Ed, if you'd like to try yeah, that one. Let me just say a word on that, and then, then I hope Francis and, and uh, uh, Juan will come in, because if it's the last question, everyone have a, uh, something to say on it. Um, and Bill Pace asked uh, uh, Romeo Dallaire a similar question about regime change. Uh, when member states would ask me about regime change, I said, of course R2P is about regime change. It's getting regimes to change their behavior. That's what we're trying to do. It is about change, but it's change in the way they act. It's not in the change of the nameplates. Uh, no, I don't think R2P should be about uh, shifting who rules the country. Uh, that's not what it's about. Uh, now, you know, it may be factually that in some cases real change won't come. Uh, without that. But R2P cannot be defined as wanting to, to, to change the name on the door. I just think that that's a kiss of death. It's going to go nowhere. And, uh, you know, I think we have seen cases, and I think there'll be more cases, which, where regimes will change their behavior. And I think uh, R2P is all about persuasion. It's all about changing the politics. It's about putting on pressure, saying that certain kinds of behavior is acceptable internationally, other kinds of behavior simply are not acceptable. Um, and I think the public role, the civil society role, the parliamentary role, the media role, uh, the educational role can be extremely, extremely important all, all that. In the long term, that's what matters most. Uh, that's really where R2P hopefully makes a difference. It's about values. Uh, it's about principles. It's about standards. Uh, and that's just the same pattern that human rights followed, that humanitarian law followed. And I think R2P is following that same path. Uh, you know, there will be particular cases that are acute and require an acute, immediate response. Uh, but fundamentally, we're trying to change the calculus in people's minds about what they can and can't do. And I think Francis's work on sovereignty is responsibility 
very much laid the, the foundation for that. Uh, uh, by the way, Francis, uh, uh, my wife and I, Dan, are just doing a paper for this book. And I tried very hard not to refer to you and, and sovereignty as a responsibility. I, I had to, though. I, 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 couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't find a way not to refer to him. It's just very, very foundational. But to me, that's, that's the way I see it. And, and uh, um, you know, it's um, understandable that countries would sometimes use something like this in somewhat different ways. And it's understandable that perspectives are very a little bit. But I don't think the UN is going to come out with any principles that require changes uh, uh, in government as a, a fundamental piece of it. Um, but uh, I, I hope that Francis and Juan will respond to some of this. Thank you. I just just uh, before you I'd like uh, all three of you, if you could also just provide a few wrap-up comments um, and give us your assessment of how you feel the future of these mandates uh, will look. Well, <laughs> on, on mentioning sovereignty as responsibility, you have done me great honor in the past. Now you can afford not to mention it. <laughs> um, can I just end with uh, a small point? Uh, in this question of um, external intervention, there is the role of regional and sub-regional organizations that uh, the Secretary General has actually written a report on uh, by edit. Uh, and I think it is important to emphasize the role of regional organizations because they give legitimacy and to some extent allay the fears that these external forces, usually seen as the North, powerful North, coming to intervene in the less powerful South. But if legitimacy for some action is actually developed at the regional level, then there is a question of capacity because the, the regional and sub-regional level usually might have the legitimacy but not the capacity to to impose any particular solution. Then it becomes a question of cooperation between the UN or the international community and the region. And that is actually now being developed significantly uh, with the African Union. Also on Myanmar, for instance, uh, there was a tendency strongly by the ASEAN region to keep the international community, the UN, out of the picture and said, allow us to do it ourselves in our own way. And their own way is based on solidarity and persuasion and talking gently to them. And they did. Myanmar is now significantly uh, tr transformed as a result of the efforts of the ASEAN region. So I just wanted to add this question of the regional approach. Would you like to add any more comments just to wrap up? Sir? Any, any other comments just to wrap up the discussion? Any other? Mm -hmm. Well, the, I suppose all I can say really is uh, we all have different roles to play. And some of us are better suited to certain approaches than others. The mandates I have handled with internal displacement or even dealing with problems in my own country of the Sudan or elsewhere in Africa, uh, have very much emphasized wanting to engage governments constructively. Uh, it's a question of assessing what is your comparative advantage and what can you do in a practical sense. Others are much more used to the culture of naming and shaming. Others may shout loud. In going to countries, I would always say, I'm not coming here to preach or to shout from the mountaintop because I'm coming from a country that is torn apart by conflict and therefore I am building from my own experiences, not coming to preach to you on just your experiences. But I just want to say that cooperation will mean different approaches coming together, synergizing and, and, uh, and mutually reinforcing one another. One of the things I liked about our joint office is that genocide is seen, the G word is seen as so sensitive despite the fact that people say it is well established, while R2P is broader. All these other crimes people can talk about with less sensitivity, even though, of course, R2P has its own sensitivities and all that. So collaboration of different approaches, I think, is key, and that's why we have kept close contact with the NGO community, civil society, academics, and all of us contributing what we can best contribute.
Thank you. Ed, any further comments? Uh, just, just two comments at the end. Um, one, I know the conference is about prevention, and I think that's extremely, extremely important. And as Francis suggested, we see prevention at the core of R2P. In fact, it's, I think, quite interesting, but not very often recognized, that in the, I think, key uh, sentence in paragraph 138, all the heads of state and government pledge to protect their populations, to protect their populations by preventing the four crimes uh, and their incitements. So I think uh, that suggests to me not only that prevention is critical, uh, but the prevention also requires a will to respond when that's appropriate. And I think sometimes people gravitate to prevention because politically it's easy. Uh, and member states gravitate because it doesn't appear to have too many implications for them. Uh, but I think what makes R2P uh, effective is that it has both. And it's that synergy and interaction between the two, which I think is very important to understand and not always easy to understand. Uh, because if it looks like you're ready to respond and maybe have nefarious reasons to do so, then that sort of undermines the preventive role. Um, and if it looks like you prevent forever because you don't really want to respond, that undermines the effectiveness of the prevention. So it's how they interact, I think, is enormously important. So I would argue, you know, to think about both of those. Uh, the other thing I, I would argue, ask about the future. Um, I do still think that R2P is fundamentally a political movement. And I think Tibby referred to a movement uh, before that were part of a movement. Um, and I think that's true, and I think that's its great strength. And uh, I think that'll be the strength of the future. And you know, if we can get over uh, Libya that's controversial, if we can get over Syria where the response has been, been so um, uh, weak, uh, and recognize we're part of a longer term historical movement, I think that's extremely important. And uh, my current uh, interest really is in the individual responsibility to protect. And my wife and I are working on a, she's a psychologist, and we're working on a paper, and we'll be working on some other papers, thinking through conceptually, what is the individual responsibility? Because if R2P is all about governments, and all about regional institutions, and all about the UN uh, handling our problems, our problems aren't going to be handled. Uh, you know, I think the question here was right about culture and values, and the way we view each other and tolerance. Uh, those really are the fundamental pieces. And as long as there's a great deal of interest in preventing genocide, in preventing other atrocity crimes, and recognizing that our role as individuals in doing that is ultimately what matters, uh, and how we hold our officials accountable, and how our officials as individuals uh, carry out their responsibilities, uh, then I think R2P has a very, very bright future, and I do think is very comparable to the human rights movement and as a piece of that larger uh, human rights and humanitarian movement. So I'm very bullish because, uh, yeah, there'll be a lot of institutional failures. And those institutional failures will remind us that we have to rely ultimately on ourselves. And sometimes we actually have to engage in self-protection. And sometimes we actually have to help protect each other. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Juan, to you. Oh, well, I, I've been in the human rights movement for 30 some years, and I remember when we all thought that prevention would be a good idea, but uh, we just didn't have a clue as to how to do it. We knew how to respond to violations. And we had mastered a really good way of, uh, of doing it, but prevention seemed to be impossible. Um, and I think in the 90s, we started, rea we started realizing that uh, prevention may, may be much more difficult than reaction, but that it's absolutely necessary. And um, I also think that uh, you know, just even the having a doctrine like responsibility to protect, and uh, you know, I, I apologize if I rush to call it a doctrine, but I hope it is a doctrine, not only uh, not just a movement, but something that informs action. Um, I think just announcing it is not enough. We need we need to create a culture of prevention, and the culture of prevention in 2005 just wasn't there. You, if, if there had been a culture of prevention. You would have seen the secretariat, you know, uh, immediately accommodating to the emergence of the responsibility to protect and being ready to act on the responsibility to protect at any given moment. On the other hand, I do think that we are well on our way to creating the culture of prevention that we sorely need, and it's because we have institutions, and I don't mean only uh, the offices uh, that we have been discussing or uh, documents like. 
like the World Summit document, uh, but also for uh, the, the International Criminal Court, for example. It is a, an, an important uh, institutional arrangement that allows us to, to deal with impunity in, in, in serious ways. Um, and I think the uh, institutions that are being created, political and other, and, and diplomatic, in the regional organizations. So uh, I think, uh, although there's a lot yet to be done, there's a, uh, we're in the infancy of prevention of genocide, we're in the infancy of uh, uh, responsibility to protect, I, uh, I am optimistic that we are beginning to learn the lessons, we are beginning to understand the needs, and we are beginning, uh, as I said, to create a culture uh, of prevention, uh, not just in the Secretariat, in the international community uh, in general as well. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much to all three of you, uh, both for your contributions this morning to what I think has been a very interesting discussion, but also to your personal commitment to creating this culture of prevention, which I know has inspired me personally and I know many, many others. So thank you again. Thank you.